Today I want to talk about uh, all the false religions that are coming to America and also are here already uh, in America. And uh, it's very difficult for somebody to look around and try to figure out now which one is the right one. And so I want to talk about a little bit about that today if I could. Uh, America has become a melting pot for many of the world's religions. Uh, today, they say, well, there's equal tolerance. Now, in their thinking, equal tolerance of one's faith means equal credibility. And in reality, that's not true. Nothing compares with the gospel of the grace of God, uh, Jesus Christ. But this is the way that they're doing that. And they're trying to say that all religions are equal today, but except for Christianity. They're trying to do away and exclude Christianity within our country this very, very day. They're trying to remove it from our government, from the military, from the media, from our educational system. Uh, this past week, uh, Blake Griffith plays for the uh, L.A. Clippers, and he's the one who can dunk, dunk, dunk. And uh, he's a tremendous leaper. And uh, somebody asked him, he said, well, how old do you think the earth is? He says, well, I believe in creation, so somewhere around 6,000 years or so, something around there. And boy, they begin to mock him. They begin to laugh at him. And uh, they could not believe somebody would believe in creation or that the earth really is not billions of years old like evolution says. But he was raised up, a homeschool boy, stayed in the faith, went to a Christian school, and he was standing for his faith even then. But if you have that today, boy, you are criticized, you are put down. They just don't like Christians today. And America is turning from the only true God. The problem is that, what do they turn to? Well, there's these religions that are beginning to infiltrate the mind and opinion of our society today outside of humanism and secularism, okay? Uh, the first one is animism, animism. And animism, me, there are millions in Africa, the South Seas, and its spirit is beginning to come here. They say uh, not humans but inanimate objects possess a soul and a spirit. And uh, they believe that spirits are in these objects and so on. They're not interested in the true God because they believe that God created everything, left man, and he left man to the lesser gods. And so they don't have anything to do with him whatsoever. But they believe that their own spirit can pass into these objects, like into a stone, a tree, a bird, a crocodile. <laughs> uh, this has led them to come around to believe in reincarnation. And there's a lot of people that try to follow reincarnation today, don't they? And we have it all around us. Most live and believe this where there are little moral laws. And let me say something about that. The more you exclude Jesus Christ and the Word of God, the lower our morals become. That opens us up for this garbage that comes into this country like something like this. The people live in fear of the spiritual world. They're, they're, they're fearful of, of these objects uh, like stones or snakes and, uh, you know, these inanimate objects and so on. Uh, there's a, uh, there, I was watching Discovery Channel, and this one uh, group of people, uh, they needed water. They needed to transport themselves, but they would not get into the river. And the reason they wouldn't get into the river, they believed there were evil spirits inside that river, you know, in a, in a different object. And so that's animism. And then there's the religions of Asia, India, the Hindu religion that came on the scene about 1500 B.C. Now, to be a Hindu, one must be born one. It's the only major religion that has a caste system, you know, this level, this level, this level, and this level. It's a color system of segregation. The top ones are the Brahmins. That's the highest caste. They're almost held to be people almost with deity. 
Then there's the Catrivas. Uh, they are the noble men. And then there's the Vases. You say, is that how you say it? I have no idea. <laughs> but let me spell it for you. V-A-I-S-Y-A-S. You say it the way you want to, okay? But these are the merchant people. And then, you know, do the work. And then you have the Sudras. The Sudras are the lowest caste. They're at the bottom of the totem pole, okay? Uh, they have no hope of salvation, these people. Uh, most of them can't read, and they're not permitted, if they could read, to read Hindu's holy book. They're not permitted of that. As a matter of fact, they can't come within 64 feet of the top brass, the Brahms. Uh, they, they can't get close to them whatsoever, and they have no hope. But in the Hindu religion, their, their system has led to polytheism. And polytheism just means there are many gods. As a matter of fact, in India alone, they believe there are 330 million different types of gods. That's in India. It's unbelievable. But also, they promote and teach pantheism. Pantheism is that everything is God. The universe is God. The invisible world, the invisible soul that's part of man is real. But the rest of the world, the world that you see, is only an illusion. What you see does not really exist. Our body doesn't exist. Our pain doesn't exist. They've never been with me when I get out of bed in the mornings. <laughs> there are a number of reincarnations, thousands of them, an individual person then can achieve what they call nirvana. Nirvana, however you want to say that. And what it is, nirvana is where one finally becomes extinct. They cease to exist or to be reborn into further cycles of life. Their soul drops off back into the ocean and ceases consciousness. That's the achievement. Well, that's a lot of hope, isn't it, huh? That's a bummer on that one. And then also about 560 B.C. in northern India was born a prince. Gautama Siddhartha is his name. Uh, he was born a very wealthy individual man and he was shielded most of his life in the palace. At the age of 29, he went out of the palace and he saw the illnesses, the sicknesses, the diseases, the dying. And he just, for six months, he just observed and he was asking himself, why did people suffer like this and so on? And he said that it came to him. He was enlightened somewhat. The reason for suffering, he said, is ignorance. He became known as Buddha. Huh? And he didn't found a religion, but people began to worship him as a god. Okay? And his name was Buddha. Now, he was a psychologist and concerned for people, their emotions, their desires. He said the reason people suffer, now get this, is because they desire things they can't have. <laughs> well, I'd like to hit the lotto, but I, <laughs> I'm not suffering a whole lot, though, right? His premise is this here. Just cease to desire things and suffering stops. Just don't desire it. It'll stop. And you'll reach nirvana, drop in the ocean, cease consciousness, quicker <laughs> if you want to do that. So the Buddhists don't acknowledge God in a sense. Uh, he didn't believe that there was a God. In 551 B.C., Kung Fu Tzu, uh, he's from China. Otherwise, his name is known as Confucius, okay? He taught some good, quaint little sayings, but didn't found a religion at all. Uh, his little sayings would be somebody asking him this question. What about life and after death? His answer was this here. How can we know about death when we don't even know about life? So he would say little sayings and things, but he offered no hope to the individual person. Then there's Shintoism. That is in Japan. That's where they worship their ancestors. Okay? Uh, they don't believe that there's life after death. And so one of the people, the living ones that they used to worship was their emperor. 
until 1945, and then that ceased. And then in the Middle East, in Africa, and America, is Islam. And that's where Allah, the Spirit, is God, and Muhammad is his final prophet. This came on the scene about 600 A.D. or after Christ. Now, they believe salvation is by works and submission to Allah. That's what Islam means, submission to Allah and obedience. Uh, Muhammad gave the Quran. And it teaches there that your good works and your bad works are on a balancing thing. And whichever one you do the most, that tells you what's going to happen to you. Okay? And they offer at the end a sensual, sexual paradise, especially for the men. They don't hold the women up too high. Okay? Islam is spread mainly by conquest of the sword. They say this in the majority of places, convert or die. There have been millions of Catholics and Protestants unwilling to renounce what they believe, and they've been killed. I've said before, in the Sudan alone, one becomes a believer, and because it's controlled by the Muslims and Islam, their lifespan is 30 days. That's their lifespan. When they say, I believe Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Then there's Judaism. They believe salvation is by prayer, repentance, keeping the law, making society better. Israel's faith is a biblical religion without its leader, Messiah. We know that as we read the Bible, Israel rejected Christ as their Messiah. Today in Israel, most are agnostics and unbelievers. But we know one day <laughs> she will embrace Messiah. Uh, we do know that, okay? Now, all these religions teach something, uh, perhaps about ethics, maybe something that's good, or a God, a small g. But what a difference between these religions... And I didn't mention a lot of that we have in America, too, because I didn't want to offend some of our visitors today, okay? But there's a difference between these religions and Jesus Christ. Christianity celebrates three events that shows the difference between these false religions and the truth. The first one we celebrate is Christmas. Uh, we celebrate the fact that God came into this world in flesh, personally, God invaded humanity. He didn't have to, but he knew it was the only way for us. John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word, what? Was God. It's referring to Christ. Verse 14, And the Word, which is God, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, Jesus's. And the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So this great God came in human form in the world that we see. Buddha, Confucius, Muhammad, Allah, none of them made this claim. But Jesus Christ claimed he, God, came to earth in flesh. He said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Huh? I, my father and I are one. We're inseparable. Before Abraham, I am. Amen? Jesus Christ, his Godhood, was confirmed by his life. What life? What are you talking about? He lived a life that was sinless. He's the only sinless life the world has ever seen. And it's Jesus Christ. Now think about it. Jesus never modified a statement he ever made. He was always right. He never apologized for anything. He was never wrong. Jesus never sought the advice of man. He knew everything. He's omniscient. Unlike Confucius, who was not well educated at all. Unlike Buddha, who was never enlightened. Unlike Muhammad, who could neither read nor write. Christ never was taught or educated by man because he knew everything already. 
As a matter of fact, he even knew the thoughts of mankind. That's something. You see, he's the one who lectured. He lectured the doctors, the PhDs, the Pharisees, the scribes, the government officials, the business-minded people. Even at the age of 12, he turned them upside down in the temple, didn't he? Jesus never once justified or had to justify his behavior because he always did right. You know, when they said, Lazarus is dead, Lord, he's your friend. He didn't say anything. He didn't, didn't justify his actions. He waited four days. And then he went down and said, Lazarus, come forth. He had a purpose and a reason. He didn't have to explain his behavior. He always did what was right. Jesus never asked prayer for himself. In the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he asked his disciples to pray with him and for themselves. We need to understand something. God doesn't need prayer. <laughs> He's sovereign. He's in control. He knows what's going on. Amen? Jesus didn't have a strong point. That would say he had a weak point. And Jesus had no weak points whatsoever. He was omnipotent or all-powerful himself. Jesus was perfectly balanced. He was the God-man in all areas of his life. Colossians 2.9 says this here. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Inside Christ, the entire Godhead, he was God in flesh. And we celebrate that every Christmas in a special way. That God loved man so much he left the glories of heaven and came down here and lived among us so he could fulfill his purpose. The second event we celebrate is the crucifixion week and the cross. You see, Jesus came to accomplish something that no other religious founder could ever do. Jesus, he came to die. Not to just teach, but to die for our sins. Confucius died because people would not follow him. He died of a broken heart. And then Buddha died. He died from food poisoning, of all things. But Jesus gave his life for man. What a difference that is. Now, just follow this if you would. Say that you fall into a pit. It's deep, it's vile, it's filthy. And down in that pit, there's this great, big, huge serpent. And he's trying to bite you. He's trying to inject in you his poisonous venom, and you're down there with him, okay? The animus religion. You know the one who says spirits are in objects? He, he sees what's going on, and he flees lest he gets bitten himself. That's probably what most of you are, are animus. <laughs> you say, I'm getting out of here. Confucius says this, a great man never falls into a pit, so look where you walk. You know, one of his quaint sayings. The Hindu Brahmin, you just think you're in a pit. The error is in your mind. It's a mere illusion. Now just think, there is no pit. There is no serpent. All is well. Peace. <laughs> the Muslim, he says, I'll help you. Take my hand. Halfway up, he says, well, you convert to Islam. You say no, so he drops you back down into the pit. The Buddhist, he says, the reason you're suffering is you desire to get out of the pit. Stop desiring, and you won't, dis, you won't desire to get out of the pit anymore. And as a result of that, you'll be no more miserable or afraid. Huh? Boy, that's a lot of help when that big old serpent's coming at you. Now, Jesus Christ, he sees you through his compassion and eyes. He cares. He leaps into that vile, filthy, 
dangerous old pit. And he gets between you and that huge serpent. That serpent strikes with vengeance. Jesus is hit. The, ger- the, the poisonous venom is going inside of Jesus' body from this strike. But Jesus lifts you out, up and out of that pit safely. He dies, but you live. That's a Savior. Amen? And that's the difference between Jesus Christ and these other religions. Jesus died for our sins. He paid the penalty for our sins himself in order that he might save us who will believe in him. Romans 5, 8 says this here. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He dies for our sins. He takes the sin off of our account and he places his goodness, his righteousness to our account and we are accepted because we're in the beloved now. Amen? The third event we celebrate each year is today. It's called Easter. Huh? We celebrate Easter. Confucius died and was buried. The Hindu leaders died and were buried. Buddha died and was buried. Muhammad died and was buried. And they're all still there in the grave. Jesus Christ died and was buried. But Jesus Christ was and is the only one who rose from the grave in a glorified body three days later. Amen. Amen. When they went to the tomb, the angel says, what are, you, what are you seeking the living among the dead? For he is not here, he is risen. We believe this to the core of our soul because the word of God says so. Not because a preacher, a church, a denomination, a religion says it so, but the word of God says it so. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. Verse 3 and 4, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's why we believe it. We believe it because God's word is inerrant, infallible, and in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised. Romans 4, 24 and 25, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. When I put my faith in Christ now, I have a right standing before Almighty God. I'm one of his children. Romans 10, 9 says it easy. Here's where you come in. That if thou should confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou might, thou if thou persevere, thou if thou work your way. No, he just says thou shalt be saved. You just believe in Christ as the Son of God. He died for your sins. He's buried. He rose again. That and that of itself is sufficient to wash away all your sins and give you eternal life. Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection gives us believers the reason for our assurance, the reason for our hope about life. It's great to know he walks with us every day. About death. We don't have to fear it. And about the afterlife. He's removed the fear from our hearts about these things. Because we know without a shadow of a doubt, since we've been saved, 
ultimately will end up in heaven. Amen? And we know this, Jesus is coming back for his beloved. That's us who are saved. Looking unto that looking up for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Now here's the flip side of this. Don't miss this. I'm about done. But also, Christ's resurrection guarantees is proof that all unbelievers will be judged by Him one day. That means you can receive him as your savior today, but if you die without Christ, one day you'll stand before him as your judge. Is that true? Acts 17, verse 30 and 31. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. By that man, Jesus Christ, whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. You, by that man, you'll stand one day. But when you stand before him, never having believed in him, he'll say, I never knew you. And off you go to hell. That's a fact. That's the truth of the word of God. God has done everything he possibly can do in order, in order to give you the opportunity to become a child of God. Amen? Amen. Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation to God, to heaven, today. No other religion, no other way is acceptable because only Jesus Christ died for our sins, rose from the dead, giving proof of the sufficiency of his sacrifice. Only Jesus, God's own son, is the Father's chosen way of salvation. Only through Jesus Christ, now don't miss this, is salvation offered by grace alone. Every other work, every other religion... They say you have, you have to do, you have to. God says everything's done. Everything necessary, everything needed for you to be saved has already been accomplished. All that needs to be done is for you to believe. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You heard that truth today. And God says embrace it. Believe that Christ is the son of God and his finished work. And your sins can be forgiven and you become a child of God, a new person in Christ. I did that at the age of 24. The greatest decision I've ever made. I'm going to have Rachel come up at this time. And I want you to see on the screen, if you would, Philippians chapter 2, verse 8 through 11. And being found in fashion as a man, Christ, God became flesh. He humbled himself. Think about it. God becoming flesh and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, because of what Christ has accomplished, God, the Father, also hath highly exalted him, the Son, and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in the earth, and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Father has elevated his son because of the unbelievable work he accomplished while he was here on this earth. And he says the way you honor him is to believe in his son. He's the only one and he's the only way. I'd like for Rachel to sing this song if you would. born son of God yet son of man and who laid down his life and rose to live again 
who rides the clouds of glory, whose kingdom never ends. There is no other name. The one and only Faithful, true and holy He's the Son of Righteousness Worthy of the glory Jesus Christ, the one and only And earth and heaven offer praise And every heart become his holy hiding place Let every knee bow down And every tongue confess the name Of Jehovah's only Son The bow our heads and our hearts and you're here this morning and you say golly I believe he is the way he is the truth he's the only way I believe he's the son of God he died for my sins you say I want to be saved let me just help you just by believing saves you but I think it's great to have a, a moment of settling that And you would say you would like to be saved today know your sins are forgiven and you're on your way to heaven and you believe this gospel, I want you to repeat a prayer after me. Saying the prayer doesn't save you unless you mean it in your heart. Man believeth with his heart. And just say this prayer right where you are in your heart. Just say, Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I do believe that Jesus Christ is your son. He died for my sin and rose again. Please save me for Jesus Christ's sake. I believe. And with our heads bowed and you say, hey, Pastor Jim, I just prayed that prayer. I meant it with all my heart. We don't come out and get you. We don't do that. But just as a word of testimony for the, the glory of the Father here.
Just say, I just prayed that prayer and I'm at. Just raise your hands right now. God bless you. God bless you. Several people. God bless you, sir. Amen. Father, we're thankful you're still in the saving business. We're thankful that if we just believe in Christ and the gospel, you save us for all eternity today. We say to those who just meant that, welcome to the family of God. Now may they may get in and grow and mature as a believer in the word of God. If we can help them in any way, we're here. We love you, God, with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name. And everybody said?